thanks, Randy. Appreciate you and the Martian Society and really the entire team. It's taken quite a bit. And, and as usual, uh, as everyone knows here, that you, really nothing gets accomplished without collaboration. And as is the case in our meetings um, and, and our studies and, and our research, we've got quite a few. And here's a few of the <clears throat> logos, as I like to call them. Uh, but um, honestly, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's been all about spirulina, uh, arthrospira platensis. I always have a hard time pronouncing that. I apologize. Uh, but in, in, and in my case, um, as I was taking this project on a couple of years ago, practically, uh, Larry Harrison had kind of come to us with this idea and thought we should probably run with it. And he brought Aaron in and Aaron has really, really put us together. And, and I want to thank both Aaron and Larry quite a bit. And they're both here. So uh, I'm going to let, uh, let Larry kick it off. Go get it, Larry. Hello. Uh, my name is Larry Harrison, um, and Terry, you want to move to the next slide, or do you want us to introduce us? Okay. Um, over the last couple of years, we, we've really seen a boom in the space industry, especially with SpaceX. Um, their launches and their reusable boosters are just incredible. Um, Blue Origin, of course, Jeff Bezos, is uh, he's really trying to compete, uh, especially for the um, tourism business and um, a couple other companies that are really up and coming Sierra Nevada um, and uh, excuse me and uh, Virgin Galactic um, last year alone there were over 700 new space startup companies and to be able to supply nutrients to anyone going to space we believe spirulina will be uh, a good uh, supplement uh, for those that travel beyond Earth's atmosphere. Um, the Artemis project uh, is scheduled to, to really take off in uh, 2024. Um, will definitely push, push us to the limits as far as our space travels go. Um, eventually the goal is to have habitats on the moon. Um, even though we've only had less than about 700 people uh, travel to space. We do know that there are a lot of physiological effects to the human body. Um, bone density loss, uh, that calcium's given up and filtered through the kidneys and it can cause kidney stone formation, some cardiovascular issues, um, cognitive and mental response decreases, visual acuity changes, um, and muscle atrophy, um, atrophy occurs. Um, and anything that we can do to help mitigate those uh, through any nutrient supplements is, is definitely a positive. The current mitigation methods, there's, there's drugs for just about everything. NASA don't like to, to really inject a lot of drugs in their astronauts. Some other organizations may. Um, they do require for, for the astronauts on the space station uh, definitely to get plenty of uh, workout, uh, a minimum of 15 hours of resistance training uh, per week. Um, they have psych uh, psychological exercises for the astronauts to complete on a weekly basis um, to help mitigate some of the radiation. There's radiation shielding on the, on the uh, space station. And then, of course, uh, vitamins and dietary supplements. Um, and that's kind of where our spirulina comes into play. And Thank you, Terry and Larry. <laughs> so this is where we want to introduce uh, Arthur's fire potensis, or more commonly known as spirulina. Um, we have chosen spirulina as our test subject for this study because spirulina is extremely robust. It is packed full of antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. And spirulina also helps support overall cellular health, cardiovascular health. It boosts your immune system and uh, is also energy boosting. Ever since the 1970s, when NASA approved spirulina as safe and practical, there has been many applications that have explored for life support systems use, utilizing spirulina. With spirulina, astronauts are able to travel light and be reassured that they are not compromising on vital nutrients. Spirulina is one of the most concentrated foods available to man and womankind, and this is what makes spirulina very convenient and uh, are very convenient to carry and consume in space. Um, 
So because spirulina is so nutrient dense, it can help mitigate some of the physiological effects that Larry had just talked about. Um, some of those physio physiological effects that microgravity has on the human body. Spirulina is very high in protein um, from 60 to 80% by mass. It is loaded with amino acids and fatty acids, including gamma linolenic acid and accessory pigments like phycocyanin. It also has vitamins K1 and K2, as well as vitamins A and B vitamins. And because spirulina is a gram negative organism, it is easily absorbed into the bloodstream. And this means that there's no additional processing needed for your body to easily ab absorb the vital nutrients. So not only can spirulina benefit astronaut health, but spirulina can also play a major role in maximizing self-sufficiency. The constant transport of resources and goods is very expensive and just not practical. And this is what makes in situ resource utilization so important. Beyond low earth orbit is resource limited. So understanding how to utilize what's already in space will reduce logistical constraints. Martian regolith is rich in inorganic elements that could possibly be used by autotrophic cyanobacteria such as spirulina. By utilizing materials that are already in space, it'll help resupply vital consumables on long duration space travel and at a future regenerative habitat on Mars. So there are several different types of regular simulants, including asteroid, lunar, and Martian. And all, most of these types of simulants have already been tested on various crops and even including spirulina. These regulus have a potential to be a substrate for food production for vascular plants and even spirulina. Um, these regulus may help support the regeneration of algae for life support systems and for food crops. And this particular regulus, MGS-1S Mars Global Simulant with sulfate addition is very highly alkaline, greater than a nine pH. And spirulina happens to be an alkalophile, meaning it likes to grow in these higher pH conditions. Um, this particular Martian regolith also has a lower percent by weight of aluminum and nickel, which have been proven to be toxic to spirulina at certain concentrations, which is another reason why we have chosen um, MGS-1S for this study. And I'll let Terry discuss what he has done at phase one of our research. Thank you, Aaron. Beautiful. Um, yeah, just got back from the University of North Dakota's Ilma Habitat, and I spent um, I spent the better part of sixteen days, almost seventeen days there. Uh, I was by choice locked in and a part of a uh, of a crew who um, was very diverse. We actually worked diligently on, on many different projects, but the, the the showstopper for me was getting spirulina delivered. Um, by FedEx rather late and, uh, and able to get it to propagate and, and to get it uh, to multiply and significantly in, in a way that, uh, that I know that I can with uh, you know, minimal effort and a, and a proper set of procedures, I actually can grow spirulina in an environment that might not be <clears throat> necessarily hospitable. We did use quite a few different things to, uh, to make it work. And a lot of it was off the shelf, lighting, uh, the, the feed stock that we use. But uh, interestingly, it all worked out in the end. And uh, you can see our team members there. I know it's a lunar image, but um, um, at the same time, we were working on it in a, a Mars habitat. So I'll leave it uh, there. Next slide. Phase two is coming up. We are um, recently funded by Cyanotech and are expecting to start working using the, the MGS-1S as a, uh, as a substrate. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really going to get into exactly what we'll be doing. That's uh, Aaron's expertise. But uh, at the same time, we are, we are moving forward. And, um, and the good news is we've... Uh, We've got the money we need to just to make sure we know we can get this work done properly. Um, and when I say proper, I mean scientifically. Uh, there is uh, lots of work to be done. And uh, Aaron, I, I'm, I'm going to leave it with you here. You might want to mention something about this slide as well. I think there's a couple of things here that, that you wrote. Yeah, sure. So for phase two of our study, the ground-based study, we want to test um, Hawaiian spirulina on MGS-1S to determine the optimum concentration of the MGS-1 to use in spirulina's growth medium. 
We are going to examine the growth rate and photosynthetic capabilities of the spirulina while util utilizing the regolith. Um, furthermore, we want to examine the media and biomass throughout the study, and this will help indicate the stability of spirulina on regolith and its ability to remove heavy metals for further research, including possible bioremediation or biomining. Um, and hypothesis one is that spirulina will in fact use MGS-1 as trace nutrients in the growth medium, and that spirulina will be safe for human consumption um, when consuming the trace metals that are in regolith. So for phase three of our study, we want to take it even further. Literally, we want to take our study into space, hopefully ISS. Um, and this is, this is the apparatus we hope to do so with. When spirulina was exposed to simulated Martian atmospheric conditions, very cold temperatures, low pressure, high UV radiation, um, air conditions, spirulina was not able to survive. So we're going to need some type of apparatus to seal spirulina in order to grow it at normal levels. This particular PBR photobioreactor manufactured by Kinetic that was actually used in a study published last year growing spirulina on the ISS is the perfect vessel to do so. Um, this particular PBR is hermetically sealed. Um, it does real-time data logging and communication with the ground, but more importantly, it does um, optical density measurements. It does PAM measurements, uh, fluorescence measurement, as well as oxygen production measurements. Um, I believe temperature as well. Um, we had some concerns with how we were going to get all these measurements with minimal crew labor and time. So this actually is the perfect apparatus to do so. It just needs a little bit of electricity and it is able to do the job for us. Our ultimate goal is to have a ground control at, um, vessel so we can do simultaneous, run simultaneously with the ISS units. Um, this particular PBR has already been ISS approved. It's very small, under five kilos. Um, and building a closed system like this PBR is very important for longevity as the risk of losing your life support systems is very high in ISS or on Mars. Another concern that we had was gas exchange. In a microgravity environment, air bubbles tend to combine into a large bubble that is not usable by algae. So they have actually installed a PTFE, a very small 0.2 micron uh, membrane to make sure that the gas stays perme is per permeated into the medium. So it's used by, or able to be used by the algae. Um, algal PBRs have multiple life support systems, including air revitalization, oxygen production for the cabin and crew, wastewater tr um, treatment and remediation, thermal control, of course, provisioning and radiation shielding. Thank, thank you, Aaron, for covering that. You, you mentioned the, um, the mesh that was in there to prevent the, the um, air bubbles. That was a question from yesterday that we got. Thank you for covering that very well. Um, to date, our current research progress is that we have performed our initial literature review, and the literature review is an ongoing, as anyone uh, who's ever done any research knows that uh, it's, it, this is a constant daily item that we try to cover. Um, we recently reached out to West Hawaii Exploration Academy and Dr. Uh, Brian Murphy. Um, this is a public charter school, uh, high school, and Dr. Murphy um, allowed us to introduce uh, our research to his students, um, and we brought two of them on, um, Andy and um, John, and we're very happy to have them on board. They've done some incredible work and uh, for our data research and analysis. Um, we do have two NASA experienced team members uh, for liaisons, um, Kara Quinlan and Christine Arbizo. Um, they both have, uh, Kara actually has some uh, missions, successful missions to ISS um, for uh, tomato studies. Uh, growth studies, and Christine is a um, proposal writer, and she, she's just amazing with her experience. Um, thankfully, to Cyanotech, we were able to send 500 milliliters of inoculum uh, spirulina culture to the University of North Dakota um, to Terry for his analog mission. Um, that shipment was delayed for five days. Um, even though we paid extra for overnight air and, and special priority handling, and it was delayed in California for two days in Memphis, 
Um, showing up at Terry's doorstep in North Dakota, very stressed, um, but he was able to, to get it to recover quite fine. Um, with this uh, presentation today, we will have completed two successful presentations with the Mars Society's annual convention, which we're proud to be a part of. And um, Andy and, and John were able to get the uh, first data analysis program written, results were verified. And again, we're just, we're happy to be, uh, have them on our team. Other people that are studying spirulina in space, a quick Google search will, will bring up some very big names here. University of Florida, University of Massachusetts, uh, one Indian space uh, university that, that uh, looks like they deal a lot with the Indian Space Agency, uh, University of Niswa, um, University of Cambridge has done some studies for spirulina. Claremont University is out of France and that's actually uh, Poffin's um, uh, university where the photobioreactor in, in one of the prior slides came from. Um, and uh, they've been doing some studies. Their studies do not include any regulate that we've seen so far uh, that I've seen published. Um, Spira Inc. is a company. Um, CEO Elliot Roth, he's uh, trying to get involved in some spirulina space studies. Um, ESA, NASA, of course, they're always ongoing and looking for anything to do with uh, uh, supplemental um, nutrients for their astronauts. I'm going to close it out. The, um, the team here, uh, critical infrastructure. Honestly, we can't do it without, uh, without Aaron. Uh, we couldn't do this presentation without the Mars Society, James Burke, uh, Dr. Zubrin, who uh, I'm uh, happy, happy to say I'm a, a follower of. And, uh, and, and at the end of the day, Kara really was part of the impetus to get us here. Uh, Larry, you ran with it. Uh, Aaron. But, a, and and uh, Dr. Miller has been with uh, ultimately the public Dr. university systems. Uh, she, she's been a strong supporter. She is our PI on this. Um, her background in astrophysics, and uh, it, it's not in astrobiology like we're studying. Um, she's just been incredible. Yeah. Uh, for her support and keeping the team cohesiveness together. Um, and uh, Aaron, when we brought her in, uh, graduated University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, her, her expertise in this has really got us going. Um, the minimal communication we had with you, Terry, to, to revive that spirulina, um, just a handful of suggestions that, that she gave us to, to transmit to you um, through those communications. It, 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 she, she took care of the spirulina uh, through your hands. Spirulina so, whisperer. Um, Great description. Yeah. And, and I think you had help if you go pop over to the next slide. Oh, Some more you. team members. Um, Diallo Wallace, Professor Wallace, um, who's a professor there at APUS also, he, he was instrumental in kind of helping, helping you on those few initial days when you guys were just so incredibly swamped, was he not? Yeah, he, we were, I, I was, honestly, I was quite stressed. I, I was worried that uh, as a showstopper was, right, we were there really for the spirulina. Uh, I had some other experiments I was working on, but uh, yeah. he was, it was huge without him. And, and you know, Scott Van Hoy was a, a big part too. Scott reached out to uh, UND and Dr. De Leon and um, and his team there and got us the uh, the time that we needed there at, at yes. Noma. So that was a huge part of it. That, Rose, that was a I worked, Rose and I worked hand in hand in that plant habitat for a plant module, excuse me, for days on end. And uh, she was a, a huge part as well. And then, of course, Dr. Murphy and, and the lads. And Dr. Jim. Murphy um, was was uh, very instrumental in yesterday's presentation and helping us edit the, the uh, PowerPoint. Um, Andy um, Culverwell, uh, his first program was spot on. Um, proud to have him on board. John did some work for us on the spreadsheets for our data, um, which uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to get that completed and analyzed over the next few weeks. And That's my fault, I owe you that. Get us a paper published. I will get it to you, I promise. Um, 
and and with that, I'm going to leave it with a, a friend of mine, James Vaughn. If anybody knows James, he's a brilliant uh, photo artist, and uh, he came up with this rendering, and uh, I think it's um, spectacular. So um, uh, with that, I'm going to I'm going to leave it to Q and A. We've got um, nine minutes. Okay. Want to show the next screen just for our reference, just for reference purposes. References are there. Should just, you need? Yeah. <laughs> just cover all our bases. Absolutely. That picture there is amazing. I do like it. I'm going to leave it up. So this is Rennie, the host. If you have questions, if you could enter those into the chat, then I will read those off. But since I'm the host, I have the luxury of asking the first question. Um, if you could take a step back and explain what spirulina is. It sounds like it's some sort of an algae-based nutrient, but I guess I'm curious if that's the case, how it can be consumed. Is it supposed to be consumed by the astronauts and what form can that take? Aaron? Aaron could pop in on that. Yeah, so spirulina is a blue-green cyanobacteria. It is a microalgae. Um, and the way that you can consume spirulina is by drying it, rinsing it and drying it. And you can either um, consume it as a powder or um, some companies even make it into a tablet form. So and you could have a spirulina smoothie then? Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, we have another, <clears throat> actually a comment uh, from Dusty Green. Uh, he says, I wish I would have known of you guys before while we were in North Dakota, I recently toured an algae sewage treatment facility nearby. They might be willing to help with a large scale test of your study if you're interested. Yeah, it, uh, it's interesting that, uh, that it, that's being brought up. Um, Aaron and Larry both work for Cyanotech. Cyanotech are maybe the premier world leader in spirulina production and we we, we grow uh axisanthin uh, uh algae and uh spirulina and our spirulina is a registered trademark hawaiian spirulina um and uh cyanotech's very proud and we're very proud to be part of that that organization to grow that um but any other algaes or bacteria that are out there that we can use for space, we'll be happy to, to work with them and, and we, study that. We looked at the bioluminescence. We were actually really keen on, on maybe doing a little work with that as well. Um, that's, it's on the back burner. And, and more one, one big point there that Terry talked about, and it was brought up in a, in a meeting or two yesterday was the, the human waste factor in the, in the treatment of, of sewage. Um, and, that, that may be a spinoff study for what we are doing now. Totally. I okay. see the alt space people are here. They're so cool. <laughs> it's such, <laughs> such a neat the VR system. I, I don't know if anybody else has got a chance to have a look at that. It's fantastic. So the next question is from William. Um, is there a digestibility issue? With spirulina due to the high can high content of nucleic acids. Um, that's a great question. I don't know much about the physiological, I guess, effects of nucleic acid. I do know that spirulina and chlorella tend to other microalgae like chlorella tend to have nucleic acids in them as well. Um, I mean, to be frank, I think it might just pose or show the individual taking it that maybe they have maybe some stomach issues, digestive issues, if they are having problems digesting it, and they might have some gut biome or enzyme problems. I don't know, though, I'm not an expert on this, the medical side of it. Um, I do know spirulina is very easily digested, though, because it doesn't have a cell wall. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, next question from Peter. Are there any more robust candidates you can think of for survival under Mars's atmosphere? Uh, absolutely. Um, Bacteria. Um, there may be some other microalgae like nanochloropsis or chlorella. Um, both of those types of microalgae have a very thick cell wall. So there will be other processes and more energy needed to utilize them, especially for, for provisioning. Um, but there's definitely been other microorganisms looked at for other 
purposes in in space. And and Aaron, I'm gonna jump in here real quick. The lack of a cell wall with, with spirulina, and it's still a very hardy algae, um, that that really lowers the cost and the energy required to process it for human consumption. Terry was able to use a simple uh, oven at 225 degrees to dry this and make it consumable r right there on, on site. On premises. Um, yeah, and, and Without and having to bust of, that cell wall with a real high pressure. Yeah, it was, it was really neat uh, to see the, the, you know, the work being done at, at right in front of me. It was, it was really cool. I really enjoyed that part. Um, it's not really an extremophile though. I, I guess that's one of the things that, we're going to expect uh, if, if we're going to use a, a Martian environment, we're going to need an, an extremophile uh, if it's going to be outside of a habitat. And I doubt, you know. Well, and there and there are large scale photobioreactors yeah. for for large scale operations. That's right, and, and I could see that happening, Larry. But I, I don't uh, I don't see us throwing uh, spirulina out on the ground in the Martian. Out on the surface, no. Yeah, it's not going to do well. I'm At least, not sure if we're going to no. be able to grow much on the surface. Probably not. Uh, perchlorate, right, was you know one of the things that I was hoping as we're testing through this is, and I know we're not going to go and buy perchlorate at the local drugstore, but um, I'd like to know if we can eliminate perchlorates or certainly have them um, uh, bind in some way to the to the cellular structure and then maybe even wash away, hopefully. But, but that's to be determined. There, there is a... Um a two-step reaction to reduce perchlorate down to um, chlorine and oxygen using two separate enzymes to do so. I don't know the exact enzymes on top of my head, but it actually is proven to be relatively environmentally safe. And when you reduce perchlorate down to chlorine, um, it's actually oxygen as well, pretty, um, the byproduct, because mm -hmm. it's released from the chlorine. That's one of the things that um, Dr. Zubrin initially brought up years ago in, in his first book, um, um, you know, the nitrates are there on the surface and then now only recently proved through, um, I believe in 2010 study that we, we know for a fact the nitrates are there, they're dry. Um, we're gonna have to release them somehow, but uh, it's interesting that, you know, that we're gonna need those. Um, and, and, and by the way, there was a great question there about genetically modifying um, those. I don't know if you saw that, uh, Rennie, but, yeah, I'm, yeah, we still have a handful of questions. I did, I, I did see something about that. Yeah. Um, a lot of these we'll answer after the fact, folks. Um, Randy, I'm, yes. I'm, once once we get um, a copy of the, of the video with the questions, there, there is one quick question. I think yeah. we got if we can squeeze in. What's your future plan for this project? Um, the future plan is to be able to to support our hypothesis that we can grow this. Um, in a microgravity environment and um, hopefully be able to study the biomass to see what kind of metals we can uptake from the Martian soil. If we can uptake and take enough of the, uh, the metals that are toxic to vascular plants out of the Martian soil, we might be able to grow vascular plants um, with, with the soil there that's on Mars. That, I'm, that, work, I'm working on that right now. I'm actually working on that with the dry spirulina and that's to be determined. Exactly. We're, we're in process as we speak. Um, I actually have images of plants growing in those environments um, that I didn't share with this because um, they're not approved. But there we are. We're three o'clock, folks. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great job, guys. Appreciate awesome. it. Thanks very much.